One of my grandsons, Roland, is very famous in our family for always asking, what's that? And when you tell him what it is he's asking, his next question is, why? So I thought I would go through a few scriptures today as we begin the Feast of Unleavened Bread and we begin walking through several of unique things that we don't do any other time of the year. When you think about it, we don't clean for the purposes of putting leavening out of our homes. We certainly don't spend a significant amount of time focusing on, I better not eat anything that's leavened. And it is unique when you think about that in relationship to the other holy days of God, other than, of course, the Day of Atonement, for which you eat nothing or drink. You know, it is a bit unique. And you think about it, you know, and you ask the question, why? Why must we eat unleavened bread and not eat leavened bread? You know, most of what is called modern day Christianity in the world around us teaches that there's nothing more for us to do other than believe in Jesus Christ's sacrifice for our sins. And it's no wonder when you think of it and what is called Christianity around us, and I'll use the term cultural Christianity. I know sometimes people get upset about using other terms associated with it, but just so you understand what I'm talking about. They portray Jesus as a dead savior that hung on a cross. And of course, in their very different way of calculating and utilizing math, they will say that will happen tomorrow while we would have looked at it happening yesterday. And with the Christ's death, we understand in the keeping of the Passover that it was a necessary thing even though when we really either watch film or we watch depictions of what happened, it probably invokes and should evoke emotion in us. But that emotion should also be something that we think of relative to the fact that it had to occur because of us. We can criticize the individuals that were the chief priests or chief offices of the priest office at that time. We can criticize the Roman government, but at the end of the day, you are responsible for that and I'm responsible for that. Each one of us. And that is something that I don't know that what's called Christianity around us really focuses on very much. But with his death alone, it didn't actually save us. When you think about it for a moment, if Jesus Christ died, but had not been resurrected, would his death alone have made eternal life possible for us? Obviously, the Father resurrected Jesus Christ, and we see in Scripture that if we're faithful to the very end, then Jesus Christ would resurrect us. You know, accepting the sacrifice of Jesus Christ is only the first step in God's plan for bringing all of humanity in a specific timetable to the Father and the divine family of God. Many people like to rush that up by saying, I'm going to be a witness to the world and I'm going to tell everyone their sins and I'm going to bring these people and save them through Jesus Christ. The reality of it is, is as Jesus said in John 6, no man can come to me unless the Father draws him. No matter how persuasive a speaker you may be, if the Father is not drawing the individual, then you're wasting your time and I'm wasting my time. When we think about this and we think about it in relationship of why we are eating unleavened bread, our time of calling is now. And that's what we should really be focused on as opposed to, we oftentimes talk about how we are to be self-examining during the holy days and the spring holy days specifically. But when you think about it, if an individual says they're going to be a witness and go out and they're going to testify and they're going to bring people in like we see in traditional Christianity around us, then they're failing miserably. And the focus for us should be now during our time of calling to ask the question, should we continue in sin? If you have your Bibles, turn over to Ephesians chapter 2. You know, 
what should we do once our past sins have been covered with the shed blood of Jesus Christ? Do we continue in sin? It's interesting what we see here in Ephesians 2, and I'll begin in verse 8. It says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. If you notice the direction that the Apostle Paul is giving for the church at Ephesus, it's more of an internal movement as opposed to trying to move other people. Traditional Christianity wants to move other people. Our example should be what others see, ask a question, and then we give an answer for the hope that lies within us. I found it interesting, like I was saying before, the night as we were getting ready, many people were getting ready and we were coming here for Passover and I met the landlord in the street out there and we were just talking and I didn't interject anything. He asked questions because it's a little odd that we would be doing what we're doing. And I used the opportunity to give an answer. Wasn't ashamed in what we were doing by any means, but that goes a lot more as we would say, towards setting a good example, then me, when we sign a lease, say, well, you know what, Carrie, you need to start keeping God's holy days. You need to start keeping the Sabbath. That's not going to probably end too well or begin too well or end too well when you think about it. And we are to be as Christ was, and we are to follow in his footsteps as best we can. And our works is not because of us, and that's what traditional Christianity or cultural Christianity around us has very different in their witnessing and their testimony. And I think some have even in the churches of God tried to do some of that. God will provide and we just need to be there when the provisions are being made. When we think about Romans 6, 1 through 2, we read this the night of Passover. The Apostle Paul talking to the home churches in Rome said, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And the Apostle Paul answers the question. He says, certainly not. And in verse 15 of chapter 6, he says, shall we sin because we're not under the penalty of the law, but under grace? And he says, certainly not. So obviously, the answer to the question of shall we continue in sin is one of the reasons that we eat unleavened bread and why we are told to eat unleavened bread every day during the seven days of unleavened bread. And certainly it is a bit different, but I hope that each time you raise whatever form of unleavened bread you prefer to your mouth, that it's more than just, I'm hungry and I'm eating something. It's a symbol. I am to ingest something so that I will go forward and understand I do not continue in the sins of my past. Matthew 19, verse 16 through 17, Jesus was asked, good master, what good thing should I do that I may have eternal life? And Jesus said, if you enter into life, keep the commandments. So we see that we are saved by, by the faith, as we saw here in Ephesians, but it's also an obligation to keep the commandments of God. 1 John 3, 4 tells us that what sin is, is transgression of the law. So if we want to look at that piece of unleavened bread each time we bring it to our lips, it should invoke a thought regarding the commandments of God, the application of the commandments of God, the forgiveness of our past sins through Jesus Christ, the ingesting of the bread of life, which was Jesus Christ, and as a result of that, the way he acted, the humility he acted in, and not trying to make a scene, but to certainly live the right way of life in front of others. When we think about the Ten Commandments. They describe God's nature, his character. And the keeping of his law is very, very important for us. You know, it is a reflection of who they are, the Father and Jesus Christ, and their character 
And each time we bring that unleavened bread to our lips, it should remind us of how those things need to be a part of the day that we are going into. It's important for us to also understand that while the unleavened bread is a representation of this, it's also the converse, a, re a, a rep reminder and representation that we have to forsake sin. Let's turn over to Revelation chapter 18. Revelation chapter 18. I know this is a bit fundamental, but sometimes I think we get so wrapped up in so, so many things, we, we, we trip over the fundamentals and we forget so easily. When we look at Revelation chapter 18, from a prophetic standpoint, it also points us to these days of unleavened bread because if we are to keep the commandments of God, if we are to acknowledge Jesus Christ as our Savior, and we are to live a certain way of life, then that is going to be very different than the world around us. Verse 4 says, I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, so that you will not participate in her sins and receive her plagues. And, you know, you stop and pause there for just a moment. Some people look at that and they think that is specific to the end time governmental influence that will, yes, control the lives of many people. And many people will subjugate themselves to keep their lives in order to keep themselves in, in, a, in, in a way that they can operate in that environment. But you and I, while we don't even have anywhere near that pressure now, don't get me wrong, there is pressure but we don't have the level of what is expected in Revelation occurring right now. And yet we still sometimes struggle to unwind ourselves, whether it is out of previous cultural Christianity beliefs or even our own sins that we know are there. Each time we bring that unleavened bread to our lips, while it is a reminder to, to live a certain way and keep the commandments of God, it's also a reminder to forsake sin. Verse 5 says, For her sins have piled up as high as heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. Pay her back even as she has paid, and give back to her double according to her deeds, and the cup which she has mixed, mixed twice as much for her, to the degree that she glorified herself and lived sensuously to the same degree, give her torment and mourning for her. She says in her heart, I sit as a queen, and I am not a widow, and will never see mourning. For this reason, in one day her plagues will come, pestilence and mourning and famine, and she will be burned up with fire, for the Lord God who judges her is strong. I went and read the rest of that. I know that there is a prophetic, futuristic application. But I want us to stop for just a moment. As we're taking in this unleavened bread each day, remember that we are to forsake sin. And remember, we aren't to be boastful as we saw in Ephesians. And yet here we see the exact opposite. Now it is in the form, in the metaphor of a woman, but it's truly of a way of life. It's oftentimes references a Babylonian system. And it is interesting. When I was having the discussion before Passover with the landlord, he brought up, and he's a Sunday-keeping person right now, and I think he's beginning to, to question a lot of things and because he's asking me, he says, you know, there's a certain church that changed the Sabbath to Sunday, and when you read the Council of Nicaea, there's nothing to say to do that other than that one document. I said, you're right. And he says, and there are a lot of people that look at Revelation, and they think that, that particular group is who that is. And I said, yep, I think you're right. It's amazing if you don't take the approach of trying to tell people what to believe and just have a conversation, how much you can have. But the point I'm drawing to here is as much as God will, as strong as he is, as we might say, pour it on for the sin of the system of Babylon, the system even that goes all the way back to Egypt, understand that if we don't forsake sin, 
the same could come to us. That's why we have to be careful and why we need a reminder each day. Let's turn over to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. We'll read verses 12 through 16 here. So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in the absence, in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Now, there's a lot of ways we work out our own salvation. And we thought we, a lot of imagery is given to us regarding the Red Sea crossing and salvation and Moses making the comment, you know, stand still, be calm and see the salvation of God. And God performed a mighty work, no doubt, to save their lives that particular point in time. But understand that it, it appears the Apostle Paul was telling us that we have to work out our own salvation, not to say that we're saving ourselves, but with our salvation through Jesus Christ comes responsibility. And that responsibility of keeping the commandments with fear and trembling is a part of what is our overall, our overall working out of our own salvation. And that means we are forsaking sin because we're putting our focus on the laws of God. Verse 13, for it is God who is at work in you. Just as God separated the seas, God is the one that's at work if we will allow him to change us to work, to keep the commandments of God. And it is work because there's forces against us to not do it. Both to will and to work for his good pleasure. You know, when you really think about what the Apostle Paul is telling the church at Philippi, he's really saying, you don't even have the ability to want to do the right thing. God is having to do all of it, just like he did at the Red Sea. The Israelites did not decide, well, you know what? We're just going to, you know, make this water separate. We're going to get on a raft and float. We're going to do whatever escape they had and, you know, could have had in mind. No, Moses told him to stand still and let God handle it. And in this case, God is handling it if we will allow him to give us the very desire and then the ability to do it. But he expects us to walk. A certain way, just like he expected after he opened the Red Sea and showed them a way of salvation, he expected them to walk across that dry land too. Expectations are given even with the great power of God. Continuing on into verse 14, do all things without grumbling or disputing so that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you appear as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life. There's that word of life, bread of life, Jesus Christ. So that in the day of Christ, I will have reason to glory because I did not run in vain nor toil in vain. But even if I'm being poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I rejoice and share my joy with you always. You know, when we look at this, we, we see so many images from the Old Testament that the Apostle Paul is referencing to the New Testament, which is very germane to the world you and I live in today. What proves that we are blameless and innocent would only be if we kept God's commandments. Would only be that if we sin and fall short, that we go to the Father, as John says in 1 John, confess our sins, and he's faithful and true to forgive them. And we are to not be a reproach in the midst of this evil world. What does it mean to be a reproach? Think about that. Sometimes we are a reproach when we want to go out and convert somebody, whether it's our family or whether it's the, somebody that we think we need to change their mind on the street. We are to forsake sin, and that's a central and sentinel uh, message. If you turn over to 1 Corinthians 5 of this, very often, you know, it's on our bulletin today as far as the scripture. Very familiar. We've Many of you could probably quote it, depending on the translation you have. But in 1 Corinthians 5, verses 7 and 8, clean out the old leaven 
so that you may be a new lump, just as you are in fact unleavened. For Christ our Passover also has been sacrificed. Therefore let us celebrate the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. You know, it requires a dedication to do this, not just a devotion. Many times in church organizations, you hear things like devotion, but what we are remembering when we bring that food, that unleavened bread to our lips, it's a reminder of we are to be unleavened. And it's also a reminder that we are to forsake wickedness and malice, which is sin, and we are to and to bring in sincerity and truth, truth on the inward parts, as as uh, the prophet Isaiah references. It is truth internal, and I don't think that is just coincidence either. You know, when you ingest that unleavened bread, yes, you are taking something that is unleavened, and it is going down your throat and going through the digestive process that's been put in place, and yes. It is in that form going inside of you. But the Apostle Paul is also referencing attitudes of sincerity, attitudes of following the truth of God, and that being inside of us. That piece of bread that we take, and that's, I think, one of the reasons why we are instructed to do it every day, is so it is a reminder that every day, and the completion of the number seven, which I know people get all into numerology. And there are some interesting common things, but I think sometimes people go way too far with numerologies as well. And when we look at the completeness of it, we are to be complete. And the days of unleavened bread are part of helping us to become complete before we are to become that first fruit and that kingdom of priests. We got to be right first before we're going to go tell other people to be right. Because in many cases, we don't have everything right in ourselves. Let's turn over to Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12. This goes back to the initial um, instruction that's given. And, and we can look at all of this very physical. But understand that as we are eating that, and we do need to be careful to be obedient to the physical, but don't think that just keeping the physical is keeping the spiritual and the, the, the real moral of the lesson and the real moral of what we're doing. Beginning in verse 15 of chapter 12 in Exodus, it says, seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, but on the first day you shall remove leaven from your houses. For whoever eats anything leavened, from the first day into the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. Not to say that, again, if we make a mistake, we start out sincerely. You know, we can still ask for forgiveness. It's all about attitude. And I don't think any of us are foolish to think that we truly got every piece of leaven out of our homes. You know, and, and if you do find that you didn't, that's that's OK, too. We have through Jesus Christ this ability to ask for forgiveness. But our intent needs to be right as well. And we need to go through the physical so that we have the right intent. Verse 17. And on the first day, you shall have a holy assembly and another holy assembly on the seventh day. I find that interesting as well. Not coincidental. You start off and you end with focus. No work at all should be done to, on them except that each what is eaten by each person. That alone may be prepared by you. So there is provision to work a little bit in making your food. But it doesn't say that you are to conduct your normal jobs, what you do for your living. And then, of course, verse 17, and you shall observe the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And notice this, for on this very day I brought your hosts out of the land of Egypt. Therefore, you shall observe this day throughout your generations as a perpetual ordinance. It is forever, and it points back to the release from sin. So this is how we're told to keep these days and the rationale for it and why we do it. But when you ask another question, why must Christians be delivered from sin? And who is our deliverer? The Apostle Paul tells us that we've been enslaved to sin 
and that Christ sacrificed himself to set us free. And that sacrifice and the resurrection of Jesus, Jesus by the Father points to our future if we remain faithful to the very end. God is merciful. I think sometimes far more merciful than we even have an idea. Far more merciful than we are. And we like to sometimes think we're pretty merciful. But yet that's only in our own eyes. You know, when we think about it, um, it's impossible for us to truly come out of sin and perfectly obey all of God's laws and do everything perfect. But it is possible through Jesus Christ's atoning sacrifice for the Father to see through Jesus Christ us. And there can be a completeness in that. And that is where we must have the right intent, accept him as our savior, accept him as our sacrifice, and then do our part to work out our own salvation. Understanding our salvation only comes through him, and we are saved through our faith in him, as we saw earlier in Ephesians. It's not because we're going to perfectly live our lives and earn our salvation. We're still required to function and do things and understand that we have that perfect example of Jesus Christ, fortunately, to provide that. And we have faith in him and what happened with his life so that we can have access to the father through him, no longer through the veil. As we know, when he died, that physical death, the veil was rent in two in the temple and we had access to the holies of holies. Let's turn over to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. As I said before, I, I think, you know, each one of the holy days have historical perspective, futuristic perspective, and they also have a perspective that is here and now for the church, here and now for you on an individual basis, for me on an individual basis. And there are many different planes in the holy days when we look at them. Um, meanings that aren't just stagnant in one thing. It's not like reading a history book, although there is history associated with it. And it's not just like reading someone's opinion of the future. There is futuristic viewpoints in it. It's, it's very intricate in details. And many times symbols are used to help us to understand the difference between the physical and the spiritual, the physical and the mental. Here in Romans 8, let's begin in verse 8. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. I find that interesting because, you know, if we think that keeping the commandments of God and we think we're keeping them right, even if we do that, we can't physically please God in the flesh. Not to totality. It's only through Jesus Christ. Moreover, in verse 9, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God dwells in you, but if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. And if Christ is in you through the body, though the body rather is dead because of sin, yet the spirit is alive because of righteousness. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, being the father, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Hence, one of the reasons why Jesus had to depart, as we read on Passover, so that that comforter would come. It should be a reminder each time we bring leaven, unleavened bread rather, to our lips each day. And you and I as humans, because we are human and fall short in the flesh, He's giving us something to remind us every single day. And you think about routines. Routines have their place in our life, spiritually and physically. Not to say that they are the end all be all, but they have their place for us. So there are a lot of spiritual lessons for us. There are physical things for us to be mindful of during this time. Be mindful not to in or take in 11 products. Be mindful 
to always be eating unleavened bread each day. I won't turn because I know we've already talked about this. I'll reference this. When we think about leaven, some people have different viewpoints of it. One thing's for sure. We have 1 Corinthians 5, 8, and it tells us that there's old leaven and leaven is associated with malice and wickedness. Jesus Christ associated leaven with the leaven of the Pharisees, hypocrisy, saying you're one thing and doing something else. Leaven of the Sadducees, not believing in resurrections, which is very odd, don't you think? I really can't get my mind wrapped around that one, even to this day. And then they certainly didn't believe in the supernatural, so they would not have believed anything about Jesus Christ when you really get down to it. Yet they kept the Sabbath. They kept the holy days. Everything that you and I keep, maybe even possibly a little more to the letter of the law physically than you and I keep. And yet totally missed the spiritual applications. And then we're also, Jesus referenced leaven associated with Heron. And Herod was always seeking a sign. And how many people, whether we think of ourselves as a Gideon or we think of ourselves in the end time, looking for signs, looking in news stories for signs. And we're all focused on the signs. And that's what was a part of Herod's issue. But he really wasn't looking for it for the purpose of belief. He just wanted to see something interesting. And when you really get down to it, it was a bit of a hobby when you think about it. And sometimes religion, even in the churches of God, can be a little bit of a hobby to some people. It doesn't have a deep meaning inside. And then, of course, the big issue with Herod was, as we would say today, he was a wheeler and dealer in trying to politically move and get things that he wanted done, i.e. worldliness. And we are to come out of the world, as we saw in Revelation 18. So I hope these reminders, these spiritual understandings can come to us each and every day and inform and enlighten us going on forward. For one final scripture, let's turn to Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2. I know we spent a great deal in the New Testament. The next message, I'll spend a little more time in the Old Testament. But I'd like to close by reading Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. This certainly should be a part of our mindset as it was with the Apostle Paul. And something for us to think about. And one of the reasons why we must eat unleavened bread every day. I have been crucified with Christ and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I have lived by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The Apostle Paul references living in the flesh, but also even though I'm physically living and doing the commandments of God, it is still faith in Jesus Christ. And that is what we're saved through, is that faith. And I hope that each time we bring that up, there is a reminder and there is a representation of Jesus Christ in that unleavened bread each day that we take.